Hi everyone, this is Neil Wright here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. I've decided to group together 11 different earwax removal procedures in one video for you guys. Uh, so this is patient one. They have a block left ear and I'm just performing microsuction. And you'll see in a moment, we've just retrieved this very long plug of really dark earwax, almost uh, looks like a cigar. It's, it's molded in the shape of the ear canal itself. So that came out straightforward. Um, and this is procedure two. So again, it's a fully blocked ear. This is a, a right ear this time. The other previous procedure was in someone's left ear. And the wax in this particular patient was a bit softer. And I'm slowly just trying to tease this out. So this is the more lateral wax near the entrance. And you can see those hairs. So whenever you see those hairs in an ear, you know we're on the outer third of the ear canal. So the outer third of the ear canal, the cartilaginous portion, is where um, the hairs are found. Um, on the bony part, the inner two thirds, you shouldn't really find any hairs protruding out from the ear canal itself. And that's because the skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal, it only contains um, the outermost layer of skin, which is the epidermis layer. And um, in order for hair strands to exist, you should have the hair follicles, which uh, originate within the dermis layer, which is the middle layer. So the, the bony part of the ear canal um, doesn't have the dermis layer of skin, it's absent. Um, so the skin that lines the outer there, the cartilaginous portion, it contains the three layers of skin, the epidermis, which is the outer protective barrier. Then you've got the dermis layer where you've got the hair strands, you've got the erector muscles, which help the hair strands protrude upwards. You've got collagen and elastin. And then you've also got the subcutaneous layer, which contains connective tissue and an insulating layer of fat. So the skin that lines the outer third is around one millimeter in thickness, whereas the skin that lines the, the bony parts are just the epidermis portion of the skin that's less than 0.1 millimeters in thickness. There's a big contrast there. And that's why the bony part of the ear canal um, is extremely sensitive, not only because it's a very thin layer of skin with, with minimal buffer, but it's also the bone. So uh, of course, bone is not rigid. Uh, it's, it's rigid, unlike the cartilage, which is the cartilage is more flexible and malleable. So we removed, removed the majority of this wax. There's just some soft sticky wax that I've just managed to squeeze out there. It's a bit mushy and sticky, and you'll see a bit of staining both on the eardrum around the perimeter of the medial aspect of the ear canal, but it's non-significant. I'm just going to hover over it very quickly. If it comes away, great. If not, it's nothing to be worried about. A bit of wax is good for us. So why do we have earwax? So the ear produces earwax, which is a completely natural and healthy secretion to protect and serve it. And it does that in three different ways or perhaps four different ways, actually. So earwax is mildly acidic, and the acidity is believed to act as a natural insect repellent, so it, pre it prevents creepy crawlies from entering your ear whilst you're fast asleep at night. And the acidity also um, helps to inhibit harmful bacteria and fungal growth, so it's got antimicrobial um, properties. Earwax is also oily and greasy, so it's a natural moisturiser, it helps to Skin, uh, lubricates it and prevents it from drying and cracking and becoming itchy. And also earwax is sticky, so any foreign particles, bodies that enter the ear can stick to the earwax or the ear, ear captures it, the earwax captures it like a spider's web. And then in most of our ears, the, the ear itself recycles old earwax and replaces it with new earwax. There's a continuous recycling process occurring. And that happens in two ways. Jaw movements help old earwax slowly migrate out of the ear, but also uh, that epithelial layer of skin that I was making reference to earlier, that part of the skin continuously replaces itself. And as it does, the old skin, as it sheds, um, it slowly migrates out of the ear in a conveyor belt motion. So, and this process starts from the eardrum. So the skin on the eardrum, as it dies and sheds, it moves sideways out of the ear. And it, as it does, any wax sitting on the surface of the, of the skin is also expelled naturally out of the ear. So earwax is there for a purpose. So we should really try and clean our ears uh, ourselves. If we do, we can actually make the problem worse because with a cotton bird, a Q-tip, you're just going to be pushing it further in. 
So this is patient three. This is a quite an interesting one. This patient attended with really crusted, dead skin. It's not earwax. This is the skin I was referring to earlier. So this skin has failed to migrate. And instead, it's collected and crusted on the surface of the ear canal. And this patient has got what we call a subtotal perforation. It's a huge perforation. And you can see there in the middle ear bones, the incus and the stapes, also known as the ambulin strip, is missing. On the right-hand side at three o'clock, you can see the round window niche. Um, so that's part of the cochlea. Um, bit secretory in there, there's a bit of mucoid um, collection in there. This patient has got slight infection um, in the past when we've removed the, uh, the dead skin. And in the presence of the perforation, they could hear much better, but um, today they weren't able to. So they will require, so it's not a fluid, there's no fluid there per se. Um, there is some um, debris uh, there sitting on the pomultry. The pomultry is part of the, uh, the labyrinth, and the labyrinth consists of the organ of hearing, the cochlea, and also the semicircular canal. It's almost the midway structure between the two. So it's all interconnected, and it just seems a bit damp on the surface there. Um, so they will need what we call non-ototoxic medication. A lot of the antibiotics provided um, for ear infections are what we call ototoxic. So they have the potential to be absorbed into the cochlea by the round window that I kind of identified earlier. And it can then cause some damage, structural damage to the hair cells. So within the organ of hearing itself, um, there's inner ear fluid and also hair cells. And in response to um, sound waves, these hair cells shear to one side. And that shearing motion um, creates uh, what we call an action potential, so a spark of electricity. Uh, and this electric signal is just transported up the hearing nerve, the eighth, uh, the eighth cranial nerve, to the brain, the auditory cortex, where it's processed as sound. So if these hair cells become damaged, so they lose their physical structure, um, then you know, that can lead to a hearing loss. And some of these medications can cause some structural damage to the hair cells themselves. So this patient will require non-ototoxic uh, antibiotics. So there's one in particular, I may have pronounced it incorrectly, but ciproflaxanin, and that's also a, a quite a common antibiotic for eye infections. And but they're, they're believed not to be ototoxic, so they're safe to use in a patient with a perforated eardrum. So this is patient four. Patient four, again, it's really crusted earwax. Now, this is really deep in the end. It's really crusted. They are a hearing aid wearer, and the hearing aid is squealing because um, when you've got an occlusion in your ear, like this patient, and you wear a hearing aid, the, the amplified sound, it, it reflects back out of the ear, off this debris, whether it's skin or earwax or infection. So this amplified sound that reflects back out of the ear re-enters the hearing aid microphone. So the hearing aid re-amplifies a sound that it's already re uh, been amplified. And this cycle continues and we develop what we call a feedback loop. And so if ever you see or, um, or hear, should I say, a person with hearing aids and their hearing aids are whistling, it could be because it's not been fully inserted. So there's, an, uh, there's a, a, a sound leakage, an acoustic leakage occurring. Or it could be that they their ears are blocked and they need to have it unblocked. So uh, there are some other potential causes as well. You can get internal feedback. So if the microphone ports are blocked with a bit of debris, that can also cause a bit of feedback. Or uh, if someone's got a profound hearing loss and there's a, a lot of amplification, um, then inevitably there will still be some leakage of sound. So patient four successfully treated their hearing aid. I can confirm had stopped whistling post-procedure. So patient five, this patient's got a lot of hairs at the entrance of the ear and the earwax is really dark as you can see. So we know this earwax has been there for a while, it's kind of what we call, we can call it vintage earwax, it's oxidized, it's become dark, so it's been there for uh, many a moon. And these hairs uh, are more common in male patients. Um, I was trying to do some research for it and uh, as to why and it's from what I can uh, read, it's because men, older men, this is a bit of a contradiction because they say as we age, um, in men, the testosterone levels decrease. But the reason why um, I've read uh, that 
uh, men in particular have more hairs in the ears and the noses because they have a build-up of testosterone. So I'm not sure what to make of that, but it's definitely more common amongst men. I can be, I can be certain of that. So it is, uh, would appear to be a hormonal reason. Um, so I've just managed to get the hook in there. And there's a little gap um, with suction. It was just too embedded. It wasn't really moving much. So it's a big lump there. And we're just going to mop all this. The eardrum is now visible, but there is a bit of a, a bit of a, just a bit of wax in the way. Someone says these hairs almost like a spider's web. It's, it's just captured some of the wax as of removing it. Is there a need to remove these hairs? No. Um, the hairs really don't cause a problem unless you can't see anything. So on a couple of instances in the past, I've had to use the forceps to almost pluck the hairs away because I just couldn't see anything. But otherwise, they're um, best left well alone. Um, with these hairs, I mean, if you if you pull it out the, from the follicles, you can, sometimes patients can develop a furuncle because of folliculitis. Um, and these hairs, there for a reason, they help to filtrate the air. Of course, some people have more hairs than others. It's just individual differences. So patient five, again, was successfully treated. Patient six had been using a lot of olive oil spray. As you can see, this wax is really wet and soft and gooey. They have got quite a bendy ear canal as well. And you can see all that oil. So this, as the patient was instilling the oil and letting it sit, they then tilted their head in the opposite direction so the oil can drain out, which is the correct way of doing it, and it just stains some of the, the entrance of the ear. But that plug came out um, without much of a fight. So I'm just going to mop up around the edge, just get all the big pieces of wax. And we're just going to mop up this region here. So this is technically just... Uh, it's where I am now, that's the first bend. So we're just at the entrance of the ear and any further out we're actually not in the ear anymore so I would say at this stage we're probably not in the ear we can see that bend we go left to the right and the ear canal straightens and that's a beautiful looking eardrum so patient seven they've got a collapsed ear canal entrance so the cartilage portion of the ear canal so the outer third that cartilage has weakened over the years so um, this patient is uh, more elderly, so it's more common with elderly patients. So the cartilage over time can weaken and it can collapse upon itself. It's why some elderly and people also have droopy nasal tips. Similarly, the, the nose, the lower two thirds of the nose is made up of cartilage and the upper third of the nose is made up of bone. And over the years, the cartilage itself, it can weaken and gravity can then take its effect. Um, so it, you can get a droopy tip. That's not everyone, that's just, uh, it, it, but it is uh, a droopy tip some come, is, is known to sometimes develop in um, more elderly patients. And similarly, it can happen with our earlobes uh, and also, as I said, the entrance of the ear canal because that's made up of cartilage. Another reason why a, someone can get a collapsed ear canal is the posterior portion of the ear canal um, near the entrance of the cartilage, still, still making reference to the cartilage portion, but the back wall of the cartilage of the ear canal, um, that can sometimes continue to grow, and it outgrows the front part of the, uh, the cartilage, the anterior aspect of the ear canal. And that posterior cartilage, it, because it kind of grows a bit more, it has less support, so it's less scaffolding almost, and it can just fall over. So sometimes the ENT, if, if there's a clinical need, so someone's getting chronic infections because there's no air going into the ear because the ear is completely sealed or they can't hear because the canal's completely collapsed, they can trim away some of that back part of the, the cartilage of the ear canal near the entrance and it just kind of allows the, the cartilaginous portion of the ear to re-support itself. So we had to stretch the ear open. Um, the plug of wax and skin is quite deep. We just manipulated it out. See, nice healthy eardrum. I'm just going to try and get this bit of skin wax that's just crusted at the front of the ear, which I managed to peel away. At the entrance, you could have, you may have seen the patient had a bit of a scab there. So the patient has been scratching the ear. So that has been, that what we've removed was causing some irritation. So hopefully they'll be fine now. So patient eight, um, this patient clearly has been poking inside their ears. They did well, actually, because this ear canal is so narrow and so bendy. 
you can actually see the indentation. I, I think they also did cause some trauma. This wax is a bit red, so I suspect there was some bleeding, and it's all that is not active bleeding now. But the surface was a bit red, and so I think the blood just kind of stained the wax a bit. So it's difficult to remove this because of how narrow the, and bendy the canal is, is. We're using the full Zollner suction probe, and you can see with very little space, if I go any further with this, it's probably going to touch the side walls. So this, the, the diameter of the Zollner suction probe is around 2.1 millimetres. And because it just about fits into the space, we can be confident in saying that this patient's ear canal diameter near the eardrum is, again, roughly 2.1 millimetres. So I've reverted to the fine end. The fine end, um, I believe it's 1.28. So it's a gorge 18. And I think the external diameter is 1.28, I think is correct, or thereabouts. So uh, we are able to insert that further. Still can't fully see the eardrum. Now, there's going to be a little bit of wax left right in the top left corner, um, but I'm going to successfully remove all this. So you can see the ear is really bendy. I'm just stretching and straightening the ear canal with the endoscope. And once I have, I'm going to enter with the fine end and I'm just going to touch the surface. So the eardrum is somewhere here. Unfortunately, that plate came away without much resistance. And the reason why I said the patient did well getting the cotton bud in there, it's not only because of how narrow the ear canal is, but how bendy it is. So they must have put quite a lot of force to be able to push the wax that deep into the ear up against the eardrum. It was instant relief for the patient when I removed that last plug. So I'm just mopping up some of these bigger pieces of wax on the canal walls. It's not really going to cause a problem to the patient, but if it comes away, if it's risk-free, we'll just remove that. And this, this is a good illustration of how bendy the canal is. The endoscope is it's aligned directly into the middle of the entrance of the ear canal. And our, if, the ear, if the ear canal is completely straight, what we should be seeing here is the patient's eardrum, but we're not. We're seeing the midsection of the back wall of the ear canal. So our ears are, are designed actually to be bendy. It takes the shape of an S bend or uh, also known as a sigmoid shape. And the curvature, the S curvature of the ear canal is believed to be an evolutionary um, um, uh, uh, advantage because it's believed to help protect the eardrum from any foreign bodies or particles or sharp objects that may pierce the eardrum. So when you've, if your ear canal is completely straight and you have something enter your ear, it's likely to make contact with the eardrum. But when you've got bends and twists, it somewhat protects the eardrum um, from any trauma. So we all do have uh, an S-bend, but obviously some people have really um, more pronounced S-bend ear canals than others. So it's again, it's just ind individual differences. So this is patient nine. They've got this kind of mud sticky type of wax. I've just put some olive oil spray in there to change the consistency, to help bind this together, but also to help reduce any blockages. When you've got a wax like this and you're performing microsuction, sometimes the wax can travel up the tube and block it. So you lose suction power. That means I have to come out of the ear, um, halt the procedure, use a cleaning rod, thread it through the, the suction probe to unblock it and then re-enter the ear. So sometimes with some olive oil, it just minimizes blockages. Not always, there's sometimes even if you put um, a lot of olive oil in the ear, the suction tube can still get blocked. But on this occasion, it worked really well and that plug came out in a singular piece. Textbook eardrum. Again, it's got a bendy and narrow section to the ear canal. So the, the lateral third, the, the outer third, the cartilaginous portion is quite narrow, but once you um, go beyond the, the outer third, and once you're on the bony part of the ear canal, the ear canal is a good size, more of an average size. So our, the ear canal um, size, it varies from individual to, to individual and also along different sections of the ear canal. On average, the ear canal length is 2.6 centimetres, that's an average adult. Of course, there's variation there. Men typically have longer ear canals than women, and of course, adults have longer ear canals than um, children. 
the width and diameter is also variable amongst individuals. Um, the height of the ear canal should be greater than the width, which that's what gives the ear canal its more oval shaped um, configuration as opposed to a circular round shape. And again, it varies at different sections, but the narrowest parts of the ear canal is typically between the first and second bend. We call that anithmus. So that's the outer, again, in the outer third, and also about a half a centimetre away from the eardrum. And the widest sections of the ear canal is typically right near the entrance and also to right in front of the eardrum. The average width of an ear canal in an adult, I would say it's between 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 8 mil, and the height is between 0.7 to 0.9 millimetres in height. But again, there's so much variation amongst people. So patient turned, quite a crusted plug there. Again, it's the left ear. This patient's ear canal, as you can see, it, um, all of our ear canals, again, we do have an upward slope, around 32 degrees. I'll say this patient's is just slightly more. And then as with this patient, as we approach the eardrum, the ear, the ear canal, uh, it drops about half a centimetre away, downwards, and that creates what we call an inferior recess. There's a little uh, a base in there, or trench, if you like. And then... Typically, we can also have an anterior recess to the front wall of the ear canal near the eardrum. There's a little crevice there. We call that the anterior recess. Quite often, um, if you weren't using an endoscope, it's hard to visualise the anterior recess and sometimes the inferior recess. So an endoscope allows visualisation of that. And last but not least, this is ear number 11. Again, a big plug of wax, quite dry. Just going to go in with the suction first. I can feel that it's quite dry, it's quite embedded, and I, memory serves me correct, I might be wrong, but I think I'm going to use an ear hook in a moment. We shall see. I'm just trying to tease this away. I can see the wax plug is separating. You can see to the right. It appears to be separating anyway, or is it coming out in a big plug? We shall see. So I'm just trapped at this, at this point. And I think, yes, I'm going to use the St. Bart's ear hook. I'm going to go to the roof. I'm going to just, just bring this down a bit so I can get a better view. And then I'm going to embed the tip of the hook into the core of this wax plug and slowly bring it forwards. As I do, I've got to be careful that the tip of the hook is not up against the canal wall. Um, and I'm not applying too much pressure because that could quite easily cut the canal wall or abrase it, which can then lead to trauma and possible infection. So that plug came away, and again, just reverting back to the suction, just to mop up some of this sticky skin, I would say, which is lining the roof of the ear canal. And again, that's the front section of the ear canal, the, the lateral third. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, compilation video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.